hear me? All right, I'm going to climb over this power cable. Um, hi, how are you guys? A word to the, a little warning, I, I got glasses this week and they're making me really crazy, so if I look dizzy or pass out, that's, that's why. <laughs> awesome. Um, so we're here to talk about survival. Uh, <coughs> and before I get into it, I'm going to just give you a little bit of info about me and my practice. Um, I've been uh, working in exhibition design, installation, interactivity, interactive media for about 15 years, um, making a whole lot of different kinds of things for different institutions, um, both here in Portland, in uh, the US, and abroad. Um, it's work that I really love doing, and I'm super excited about it. We're not going to talk a whole lot about it today. Um, this is kind of how I got there. So I kind of started my background in uh, theater and performance, actually. Um, I came in to design through theater. Um, I worked at the Holocaust Museum in DC for about five and a half years designing uh, multimedia interactions, um, both online and then in space. Uh, I came out here and worked at Second Story, took a little tour in architecture, took a little tour in marketing and media um, event production, um, and then uh, have started up this, this studio practice. Um, with my partner. Um, plus and greater than is, uh, it's kind of built on the whole idea of collaboration. I really, really like people and I really, really like working with them. And I feel like the way that we create powerful work is to have all these different kinds of ideas sitting together with us and looking at problems to solve. Um, we're more and we're better than we are on our own when we're with others. Our mission at Plus and Greater Than is to uh, reunite culture and place through art, design, and discourse. We also like to argue a lot. Um, uh, some projects that we're working on right now um, in town uh, are actually with OMSI. We have a number of projects going with OMSI right now, and they have been super, super exciting to work on. Um, one of them is going to open in the next month or so um, outside the planetarium. Uh, we have some fun little projects and a lot of pro bono work by a lot of incredible talent, incredibly talented people like Kristen Southwell, um, uh, Thomas Wester, uh, just a, a ton of people have been helping us make this real. Um, the other exciting project that we're working on, um, which might be one of my favorite things I've ever had the opportunity to do, uh, we are partnering with OMSI to redevelop their early childhood experiences and developing two new spaces for how kids come in to science um, from infancy all the way to, um, to, to being eight, eight and beyond. Our practice is really about humans, place, and culture, a few things I really, really like. Um, so back to this, right? This is my, my seemingly narrative or linear path uh, to where I am today. And it's not really all that linear. Um, it's easy to put on a slide and make it seem like I knew exactly what I wanted to do when I got out of high school. But sadly, um, because I'm old, the internet didn't even exist when I was in high school, so I didn't really know that that was something I'd be into. Um, so I have this big old asterisk that happens here. And because we're talking about survival, um, this is actually a really key moment in my life where things really changed um, in an important way and, and really shaped the way that I developed. So we're going to chart, start with a chapter um, of, of the self, survival of the self. What does that mean? It means that uh, many, many years ago, I was giving up theater, trying to figure out what the hell to do with myself after that. Um, and I was really curious, and I was really driven, but I was super afraid. Um, I've always been someone that can try things out. I can, I'm very gestural. I can like jump into something and give it a shot. Um, but I really didn't feel like I had a depth of knowledge in anything. And I lived in Manhattan where all of these jobs that might be of interest to me are so competitive that there was no way that I could just easily leap a career. I really didn't know what to do. This quote by uh, Rebecca Solnit from literally one of the best books on the planet, uh, Field Guide to Getting Lost. If you haven't read it, you should. Um, she attributes it to Plato here. And it, it's, it's really 
Um, this is kind of my mindset. How will you go about finding that thing, the nature of which is totally unknown to you? Right? We get in these moments where we don't really know what it is that we're supposed to be doing, but we know that we feel that there's something there. Right? Can't really quantify it. I don't know how to do it. I don't know who can teach me. So that leads me to 2003. And okay, this is a really weird image to put up here perhaps, but <laughs> one thing I really like to do when I'm doing image sourcing is I type in a bunch of stuff and hit some filters and then I just pick the first thing that comes up. So when you type in 2003 and limit it to line drawings, this beautiful piece of art is what comes up. We're really into Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. It's awesome. Um, so in 2003 was sort of this pinnacle moment where I was really struggling with like what the hell to do with my life. Um, and then this happened. May 29th, 2003, while Shaquille O'Neal was getting the Association of Airport and Seaport police honors um, for his dedication to many things, again, another random image that I found by searching this date, um, I was being diagnosed with acute myelogenous leukemia. It's a pretty aggressive blood cancer. Um, I had about a 30% chance of survival. I was 28 years old. Uh, I was diagnosed one day, admitted that same day, started chemo the next day, was in, in uh, treatment for about nine months, um, usually for one month stints in hospitals where I couldn't leave the floor. Uh, all I had was me and an IV pole that was incidentally named The Colleagues, which is kind of the best thing ever. <laughs> um, and I had a really big uh, realization in that moment. I worked actually at an investment bank and I realized that if I die, and I do this, this is all I have done, I will be so fucking mad at myself, so pissed. I'd be dead, sure, but I'd be so, so mad. I would never forgive myself. Um, and I decided that I needed to make a change. And so at first I threw myself into like, well, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna go take classes, I'm gonna do all these. I was like bald and really skinny and didn't have a whole lot of energy, but I was really motivated. And then my doctors were like, maybe you should just try to survive before you figure out the rest of your life. And I was like, oh, that's pretty probably a good thing. Um, so that's what I did. I thought about survival and how I'm gonna frame survival. Because the way we frame it determines the way we live, right? That's kind of the point. So I decided to um, look at cancer as an art project and do a lot of ridiculous, ridiculous things. And sadly, I can't find my old computer, so I'm missing some of the photos, but I'll give you some of the key ones. Like, I took up paintings. It's, it's paint by number, but this is a masterpiece. Um, it's called Maddox Pride. It's gorgeous. I still have it hanging in my house, and people think it's really weird. Um, I wanted to make sure that my family knew that they could also laugh at what was happening. And so I made this incredible calendar because when you're bald, you can wear lots of wigs. <laughs> lots. Um, it's terrifying. Also, that headband up there for, for my character Bjorn, um, it was a, a, like a literal tennis band with flip-up glasses. They're attached. It's amazing. Um, I started taking free classes in weird, uh, in, in clay. This is a little uh, model of the colleagues right here. They were a good friend of mine. Um, blood cells, platelets, just different things, anything to get my mind off what was going on. Because beautiful things grow from shit. <laughs> and I look really good as an old man. <laughs> Somebody dared me that I couldn't really make it look like an old man with a costume for Halloween, and they were so wrong. <laughs> um, but beautiful things do grow from shit. The things that are the most difficult in our lives are actually what makes us stronger, right? They give us resiliency. They make us look at the world in new ways. And that's a super important lesson to remember. I'm gonna give you a little um, Eno drop right now because he actually says this really beautiful in um, uh, a film by Daniel Lenoir. So a little, oop, oop, just kidding. Can I, ah! how do I do it? Staley, help me. It keeps flipping. It keeps flipping. Damn it. Something's wrong. All right, well, I fucked it up. Anyway, <laughs> what he says in this is Daniel Lenoir is asking him, what kind of film should I be making? I want to make a film for creative people, and I want to, to teach them that they can do things differently with their life. And, and he asks, you know, you know, you're an artist that makes huge impacts but you work at a really small scale and you work often by yourself or you know, in a small studio. 
And he says, I think what would be really important for people to know is that beautiful things grow from shit. And that people think that uh, you know, musicians or artists like Mozart just, just became that way, not from work, but just because they were. And that we are all unpromising beginnings. And if we all realize that we're all unpromising beginnings, that maybe we can recognize that if I'm an unpromising beginning, I can still start something, which is a really, really powerful thing to know, right? And so for me, in learning how to start something, I realized that what I needed to focus on, and I didn't know exactly what it would be, but it had to be away from me. It had to be away from myself, and it had to be about others. Um, so we're going to move on to the chapter of survival of listening. Um, so with all my joy and optimism and, sir, and resiliency and power, I went to the Holocaust Museum in DC, which is filled with optimism. No, not really, but, um, but actually it is. Like the, this was one of the most powerful places that I've ever, ever worked. Um, I got there, I had no idea what I was doing. I had basically been working at this investment bank and teaching myself all these random, random things. Like, uh, maybe we could do a video online course and training for people abroad in Hong Kong. Like, I, I would just like, I'll teach a video course. Sure, I can figure that out. I, I was just taught myself all these skills. Um, and when I got back to work after being out for nine months, I really had no idea what to do. And I saw this listing for the Holocaust Museum for a production coordinator that had all of the things I had just taught myself at this ridiculous job that I didn't like. Um, I applied, I got it, it was like the most incredible thing. And I spent the next five and a half years working alongside the most incredible people who believed that we could all be better and believed that their work had to be addressed and pointed at other people in the world who were not as fortunate as them. That we must be courageous, we must try things, we must risk everything. Um, and beyond that, I worked with people who trusted me more than I've ever been trusted in my life. And I literally had no idea what I was doing, but they gave me such space to figure it out. Um, they developed me, one of the most incredible things that my mentor at the time said to me was, I'm not preparing you to be really good at the job you have now. I'm preparing you to be a good human so that when you leave here, you can take that work and apply it all over the place and we can just build a better place just from an intimate relationship between two people, right? That, that's important. Um, it's the kind of leader I wanna be for sure. And another thing that I started realizing while I was doing this work was that the way that I saw design, the way that I saw choreography had so much to do with my life before, many years before in theater. I never really realized at the time. I thought like I'd always done graphic design on the side or little things here and there. But to really sit in the, in the way that I saw the world had to do with being on stage and being with an audience and listening to them and really understanding how they felt and how I felt and that this was a conversation. And it brought back these two things that really when you're an actor, these are the, literally the only two things you can do on stage. This is it. Listen and respond. Those are the only things you can do. You have to be present in the moment. You have to really feel what's happening. Just like now, right? If you guys weren't here, I'd just be up here babbling by myself and I could do a little jazz hands or something, dance around a little bit, not be embarrassed. But, but if I, if, when you're here, it changes the way that I'm talking. It changes the way that I feel. Hopefully it changes the way that you feel and we can make something together just by sitting here and talking together. Um, that really started informing all of my work. I came out here, I wanted to kind of branch out um, from one subject matter. Um, and, and I came out to work at Second Story and all of a sudden had access to all these incredible institutions. Um, working at the Natural History Museum in LA County on a really fantastic exhibit called Becoming Los Angeles, which is telling the cultural story of Los Angeles. Um, I got to work on with, with honestly some of my favorite humans on the planet who a lot of them are here today and they're just my people. Um, coming out here and working in this kind of work, um, which is a really small little world of weirdos. Um, I, I found other weirdos <laughs> who like could be dorks and also be smart and also be funny and also be, um, you know, I don't know, weird. Um, and I've worked on some of the most incredible projects ever and all of which thinking about the way that we listen to our audiences, the way that we respond to them, the way that we challenge them, because it shouldn't all be easy, right? You don't want to just go in and click on a bunch of things just like you do on your phone in your pocket. You need to be challenged by work. Um, 
And then sometimes you also need to let technology go. You need to know when to use technology and when not to. All of this is to say that listening is a magic and strange thing. It's a creative force. And when we're listened to, it creates us, makes us unfold and expand. I love this so much because it's really about when we show up and just sit and be quiet and hear what other people are saying, that can make them bloom in ways that we can't anticipate. It's really powerful. So there's just a few things that help us develop these kinds of things, right? So story, obviously. Story is just a set of relationships that gives an experience a reason to be. And then feelings. God, I love feelings so much, you guys. <laughs> I'm like really, really into them. Um, but you, finding ways that you know, we, can, we can shape someone else's feelings, we can shape our own, we give and take, we know that we all exist in this real body, right? This place, which, and the experience, it affects the whole body. We can't be designing just for like, boop, boop, like that's the most terrible thing ever. You gotta get people to use their whole body. When you use your body, you learn in a different way. You're using your arms, you're, using your, you're crouching down. Like what does that mean? How do people use their bodies in different kinds of work that they do and how can we understand it better? An audience, well, I've talked about audience already, but um, being aware that they're there. Anne Bogart, uh, who's this incredible theater director, she had this great quote where she says, without a receiver, there is no experience. And she's totally right. If you've forgotten that, then you're not gonna make work that people can understand or, or, or um, express. Then I ran into, I ran into Anne Bogart again, and this, this uh, quote really signifies to me the power of ideas and the power of design. I want an artistic explosion. I want acting that is poetic and personal, intimate and colossal. Colossal is such a good word. I want to find resonant shapes for our present ambiguities. I want to contribute to a field that will engender moments on stage that broaden the definitions of what it means to be human. How we frame our work de determines what we give, what we can offer, right? So here's a fun one, the survival of humanity. Hey, we're here. And we're all just animals. I like to really remember this all the time, right? We're not just these like sentient beings that are so much better than it. We're animals, we are animals. Uh, we have innate instincts that shape our perception. We need to challenge those all the time. Just like in the animal world, right? We look at these instincts in awe there's all these predator, the way that predatory behavior happens. We, we look at this kind of footage on National Geographic and we're like, wow, that's the power of that. It's like terrifying and also really important. We look at animals in awe that exhibit unexpected kindness that we wouldn't imagine. And these things are present in ourselves, right? We have to choose how we want to be. What animals do we want to be? We have basic needs. <laughs> I'm going to go through them quick. We got air. I'm really old, you guys, but I really love this movie. <laughs> we got water. I couldn't find a funny one. I, I, sorry, I gave up. Um, we got food. <laughs> Clearly joyful. Shelter. <laughs> Sanitation. These are some additive ones for the modern, modern people. Touch. Sleep. This is kind of long, but it's really worth it. <laughs> we got personal space. Yeah, exactly. We have innate behaviors that aren't always pretty. Again, it's a choice, people, right? We need to be better. Our work, our work is not new. We've been making stories and media for, for thousands of years. Cave paintings, th those are the first stories that were ever created, right? We shared, we needed to share. Maybe story and community isn't part of those, those basic needs, but I believe that it is. Makes a difference when we can sit in a room with people, when we can share a meal with them, when we can look them in the eye, forget all the stuff that we argue about all the time, and just remember that we're all humans and that we're here together. Even if our tools are new, <laughs> our work has to be about more than just ourselves, right? And more importantly, it has to be made with people who aren't just us. 
One thing um, I, I found by working really collaboratively and deeply is that we all come to the table with a, sh with a set of experiences and a set of skills, and maybe we're good at like some things. We're never gonna be good at everything. And when you can sit in a room as equals with a bunch of people who do a whole lot of stuff that you don't do, and you can be open to the fact that they're gonna have a better idea than you, or that someone's gonna have an idea that you would never have expected, and how those things start to layer up on top of each other, and they expand out, and they make this work that is so important. And if it was just one person making it and everybody else producing it, it wouldn't be that special. Like, we really need to get over ourselves and get out of our own way and get over the ego. We are an unpromising, unpromising beginning, and we can start something. We really can. Survival of optimism. I sure like it. Um, when I ran, into a, I ran into a friend of mine, Kim Covell, uh, a few years back, um, I was going in for a, I do a one year, a yearly annual uh, checkup with my oncologist. Uh, it's been 14 years for me, so it's not really something that I worry about too much. But she was in the middle of treatment, and we just ran into each other in the waiting room. Um, and we started talking about anxiety and fear, because when you're going through something like that, you get stuck. You, you, everything is scary, and everything is new, and you don't know how you're going to screw your body up. Um, uh, I ran into her and she asked me, when does the anxiety kind of go away? Like, am I always going to feel this freaked out? Um, and I said, it quiets. Like, it takes a long time, but it quiets. And there's things that kind of sneak up on you or an experience you have and you don't remember that you feel that way until, until all of a sudden in that moment, you're like, okay, okay, I'm going to get through it. Um, but it quiets. It's going to be okay. And she was one of those people who took her experience and she turned it into something so fucking powerful. She and, um, and Mark Smith, uh, they both work at Nike, they created this hilarious coloring book. They didn't have paint by numbers, apparently. They created a coloring book, an uh, adult coloring book for people that were going through treatment. And it's filled with all these hilarious things. Like this is actually, uh, it's a happy hour for your chemo cocktails. Um, <laughs> They uh, kickstarted this. It was fully funded. They have given this book out to 40,000 people across the world that are suffering um, and going through treatment right now. Um, she's an incredible, incredible inspiration. And what was interesting is she, um, just a couple months ago, we were sitting down having a drink, and she said, it's faded. I don't feel that fear and that anxiety in the same way anymore, but I miss it. And it, it was funny because I hadn't thought about it in a long time. It's been a lot longer for me. And when she said that, I realized I missed it too. To, to be able to put yourself back in that moment. Uh, another thing that's magical about being a human is that your body doesn't allow you to remember true pain, like what it actually felt like in that moment. That all goes away, otherwise nobody would have lots of kids. <laughs> um, it goes away. But to remember that place that you were, to be able to get back at least to a place where you can look at the world in a way you didn't expect and feel like you could do better, right? Or feel like you could see somebody or something or someone that just needs to be seen. Those are all really important. So this Memorial Day weekend, we went camping, a bunch of friends and my beautiful family is all here in the front row, except for my son who likes soccer better. It's cool. It's cool. <laughs> He's a little guy. So it's okay. Um, we went out to Eastern Oregon and we went camping. Um, <coughs> Memorial Day weekend, May 29th. <laughs> didn't even remember that that was my cancerversary. That was the very first year that I didn't remember. Usually that date is like, I actually celebrate it in a lot of ways, even though it's weird because it's the day I was uh, diagnosed. It was the day that really shaped the rest of my life, that I can feel proud of, that I didn't give up, that I can forgive myself a little bit. Um, yeah, it's, it's weird, though, at the same time, to forget that. I don't want to forget that. I want to, like Kim, I want to remember what that feels like so that I can be present um, and challenge myself more. And um, this, this week has been a, a tricky week for us, too, because another person in our family is uh, struggling with survival right now. 
Um, and he is just an incredible, incredible person who busts his ass all every day, has <laughs> literally never lived a day in his life that he hasn't done like way more than any of us have ever done in our lives. Um, and he has a blog which has the best title ever, How Many Summers Do You Have Left? He really doesn't fuck around. <laughs> um, but he's, going, he's, he's working through it too, right? And it doesn't have to be cancer. It doesn't have to be that thing that changes you. It doesn't have to be an illness. It can be anything. Any of us have an opportunity to at any moment sit down, look ourselves in the mirror, and say that we want to make a change. And we don't not need to know how. I don't know how. <laughs> not all the time. But if we can work together or say, hey, I think I could do this one thing. Maybe you could do that one thing. Maybe we could have a dinner party and talk about it. Maybe you have food and wine. It's totally fine. But you can, you can work from that. This is actually a quote that uh, Kate Bingham and Bert said way before I ever met her, but I love it so much. From my experience, you can't wait around to find what you love. You gotta work your ass off. And then you find what you love by doing piles and piles and piles of work. And the reason I put this here is not that this talk is really about finding what you love, but it's about the work that is necessary to get to where you want to be. That's work personally, that's work professionally, that's work with a community. It's not easy. If it were easy, we'd already have fixed everything on the planet. We'd all be like walking around, again, with jazz hands. I don't know what my problem is, you guys. <laughs> we're humans, and we're present in this place. Place is really important, right? We're sitting across from each other. We're looking in each other's eyes. And we can build a culture together. How we frame our world determines if we survive. I don't mean we're all going to die tomorrow, but it, survival is not just about just being alive, right? It's about something more than that. And I'll end with one quote by Samuel Beckett, who I love dearly. <laughs> I can't go on. I'll go on. <laughs> we can all do it, too. Thank you guys so much.